Hi, I'm Jason Gorber for ThatShelf.com and we're here to talk about Dune. Big shelf. So Denis Villeneuve's Dune has been a long time coming. It's one of those big productions that obviously got caught up with the pandemic release. There's been lots of back and forth about when it should be released, whether it was just going to be put on the streaming or get a big screen um, debut. And I'm well aware about all the challenges of actually getting to theaters, particularly in places where um, um, certain controls are not in place. But I have to say, as a movie fan, I'm ecstatic that I got a chance to see it on a really giant screen. I've yet to see it in true IMAX. I saw it on a IMAX screen, but to have the opportunity to actually see it in its absolute visual glory um, is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. For those, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Denis Villeneuve's work. Um, you look at just absolute shattering masterpieces like Sicario. Um, uh, I love his film on Sandy. I love um, his, his one of his earlier films, Polytechnique, is incredibly raw and just sublimely riveting um um uh he he has these films like prisoners which didn't really work for me narratively but were still visually quite sumptuous um uh, i think a lot of people got into his films um with um something like prisoners um and then followed on from there but for me that's a film that sort of was much more style than substance i thought that the narrative dragged on too long and so i was wondering where are we going to get um something like this are we going to get something more of that or are we going to get something like blade runner 2049 i know a lot of people didn't really respond to it but in many ways i think 2049 is smarter and better made than the original Look, there's three, five, seven cuts that Ridley Scott has done with the original. Clearly, it was groundbreaking. Clearly, it had so much going for it. It's a tight little sort of action piece. But 2049 really delves into some of the, the deeper, for lack of a better word, the psych, uh, psychological and philosophical elements of, of the greater narrative in a way that I think is deeply impactful. And just the dynamic between the, um, the two characters is much less, for lack of a better, somber. Um, um, there's, there's, it's, it's certainly dark, but it is less sort of operatic. I, I mean, it's silly. We have both films. We don't have to choose. We can watch Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. But I really think in terms of taking sort of a beloved uh, narrative and running with it, um, 2049 actually gave me a great deal of hope that we would have something um, truly special with Dune. Now, all of you will know um, Dune uh, novel came out in the 60s. Frank Herbert, many people adore it. Um, uh, I was much more of a Tolkien guy um, than uh, than Dune. Dune was uh, the, really I read Dune when the movie came out, when David Lynch's film came out in the mid '80s, um, and I I did something that I've not done uh, very many times before. I finished the book and then walked up the street to the jumbo video at the end of my street and um, rented the video. And that's the only time I've actually watched David Lynch's film. I've ordered it on a gazillion formats. Uh, I never had it on VHS, but I had it on DVD. Never watched it. I have it on HD DVD to this day and I never rewatch it never really felt the need to sort of um, revisit it because even then I knew that what I was seeing was something pretty rough um, trying to cram all this stuff it sort of reminds um, a little bit of the animated um, Lord of the Rings film that sort of felt really ambitious really challenging um, uh, uh, an interesting experiment but um, generally just didn't work and so with the same trepidation that I went in um, uh, to the Lord of the Rings films from having seen how it would be translated. I wasn't sure how Dune would actually work. Obviously, we are in a much, much better space now technologically to tell these kind of stories, but also where many people are much more receptive to these grand um, epics, certainly as crazy as it is from the role of television. So here you have a big screen epic that sort of demands to be seen on a big screen, and really what's preparing people for it are these epic, long narratives like Game of Thrones that really sort of um, gave people a sense that it has much less to do with the beat by beat narratives and everything to do with like sort of crafting these these bigger worlds. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, an, another cinematic legacy, I guess, is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which always for me, yes, plays on the big canvas of big screen and gets people watching it and they're making billions and billions and billions of dollars off of it, but it's episodic in a way that uh, many television shows are. Now, um, it's clear that, uh, this Dune, if you're unaware, um, is meant to be part one of part two. It says explicitly right at the beginning, it's part one. 
part two hasn't been greenlit yet. So for all we know, given all the vagaries and all the nonsense that's going on, we might never get the second half. It roughly divides the book into half. And it's clear that Denis is a passionate, passionate um, lover of the book and the texture of the book. That's why I think this film is really going to work for those that um, really dive into it, because they're going to appreciate the realization of this stuff much less interested in anything in the form of narrative surprise and interested in character and texture. And this is key. This is not a film where you're surprised about what happens for a couple of reasons. One, I think Herbert's story, at least the early negative, is pretty straightforward. I'm giving away nothing that if you tell a Messiah story, uh, somebody who actually has dreams about the future, when these things happen, it's somewhere between foreshadowing and just generally where the hell else are you going to take this uh, this film. It's certainly a film with stakes. Um, uh, uh, you know, people uh, on, a, on, on the comic book side, you wouldn't have people being knocked off in the way that they are in this film. Again, I'm giving away nothing in terms of spoiler or whatever, but it's just like a Game of Thrones where it just became this like, who are we going to murder this week? This one feels that every time that there's a conflict, there's a real opportunity for people to generally get hurt, which you lack fundamentally in many ways with principal characters on that sort of comic book thing. So yes, it's a big blockbuster. Yes, it sort of echoes all the stuff that we're actually getting. It demands that notion of blockbuster filmmaking, but in, a, in the best sense, it's really striving to be something much more rich, much more... Um, complex in the sense of uh, its narrative density, but simply more delving into what it's like to be um, um, basically a young person who's been raised uh, to take the reins of his sort of family's legacy and is very um, reticent about it and still coming to terms with his own sort of uh, powers and everything that's sort of been culminated into uh, his being. Um, Timothy Chalamet is the star, um, uh, Oscar Isaac plays his dad, Rebecca Ferguson, um, does a fabulous job. Then you have a bunch of other actors who are, you know, occasionally get leads, but are amazing. Like you get the Brolins, you obviously get Oscar Isaac. So between Oscar Isaac, um, Brolin and, um, uh, you get this nice little sort of Coen brothers -y thing and Javier Bardem, of course, among three giants in the sort of Coen verse, um, sort of showing up here. Um, you have Dave Bautista, um, a sort of a uh, hulking presence who, who, um, is, is, uh, is perfectly cast. He's, I love him in 2049 so much the way that he, he plays it. I, I think that Villeneuve knows how to direct him really well here. He's playing a, a slightly more, for lack of a better word, two-dimensional character, but one that I believe is going to get rich as an arrow comes along. And then you have a giant, right? You have a literally giant, Stellan Skarsgård. Um, in one of my favorite films of all time, Breaking the Waves, a film that just literally broke me, um, showing up in all this um, sort of prosthetic nonsense as the uh, Baron Harkonnen. Um, uh, again, I'm not a Dune expert. I believe that's what the, the other family is. Eritrea's and uh, Harkonnen. Um, nonetheless, um, you have him doing... Brando. It's brilliant. He's doing Brando from Apocalypse Now, this big, bloated, obscene, curtsying type character, uh, complete with the wiping of the bald pate um, and the really um, chiaroscuro um, lighting that's um, done here. Um, it's, it's, it's moments like that. It's like, we know what they're doing. We know that they're having fun. They're like, let's do some Apocalypse Now. It's like, yes, let's do Apocalypse Now a lot more. It can, we can do it in a Kong movie and we can do it in this film. Roger Deakins is uh, normally Denis Villeneuve's sort of go-to for this um, sort of stuff. And some of his visual impact is uh, missing here. But Greg Frazier, who's done stuff like Rogue One, uh, is about to shoot the Batman or is shooting the Batman, whatever the production um, schedule is right now, um, does a very, very good job of bringing this world to life. Yes, it's a little bit... Um, it's a mix between the sort of um, dark castle interiors of the sort of compound and the spaceships, these big sort of open spaces in the sand that's shot. I mean, it's shot in the same place that they shot Lawrence of Arabia, Wadi Rum. Um, and so that gives this sort of dynamic between the warm blazing sun and the cold, dark interior and the contrast between them, I think visually does very, very well. Um, 
it's going to really come down, I think, for a lot of people about how much you're willing to invest in this. It's certainly, it's not a short film, um, and it's not a film that necessarily is uh, going to give you the beats that I think many audiences have, uh, have grown accustomed to. It truly is a film about texture. And when I first saw it, um, I had that feeling like, like, oh, okay, so I've sort of lived through this. It is what it is. But the more I reflect upon it, the more I sort of like that it's just something that asked me to sit back and let it tell me this tale, but do so in a way where I can have these moments that I care about, these characters that I, I can truly feel um, a, a sense. So yes, like in, in it, it's no more sort of dramatically challenging than sort of a base uh, soap opera, but nor is anything that's sort of mildly Talmudic or biblical like this. You kind of know where it's going to end up going. You kind of know who's going to be betrayed. You kind of know who's going to sort of fall through the cracks. But that's not really the point. The point is to see this rise, to see all of these elements and see all this stuff come together. And I think it does so in a really, really tremendous way. Um, as I said, I, I don't come into this as this big Dune lunatic. I know many, many, many fans out there are really um, worrying about um, how it's going to navigate. And they're just excited to see this vision put on screen, to see another translation of it. And I have to say, for me, I believe you're going to be absolutely satisfied with what plays out insofar as anybody's satisfied with anything these days. Um, I don't know how it's going to catch on, on on a sort of a wider stage. I don't really care um, in the sense that I got something that I really um, I want. One reason that I would love millions and millions of people to see is so that we know we're going to get a part two. But there's nothing about here that feels that it's sort of coddling to a wider audience. It's certainly uh, playing in a pace which is very straightforward and deliberate, but doing so with enough sort of visual gusto and character moments to really elevate the thing. So I played Venice. Um, it, it did. Some people hated it. Some people love it. This is the kind of film where it's going to um, have that kind of divided reaction. I look forward to seeing what actually Toronto audiences are going to think about it. Um, uh, uh, on, on a straight up nerdy level, um, there are a bunch of shifts between the 235 and uh, IMAX ratio. Um, you know, that Christopher Nolan is certainly one person who popularized but the Transformers films, all kinds of ones did it. Because they saw it on IMAX, it was basically going from 235 to 69, essentially. Uh, I cannot wait to see this on a true 143 IMAX. It's playing here in Toronto at the Cinesphere. Scotia 12 is our local thing, but the, uh, it's playing in Montreal at the uh, at the IMAX as part of um, a TIFF structure. Um, if you have a chance to see it there, if you have a chance to see it on real IMAX, if you have a chance to drive hundreds of miles or kilometers to go see it, I think this is definitely the way. I, I, I had a chance to see it, so I obviously took it. But what I really, really um, am desperate to see is that moment of when you actually see these sort of reflections, these dreamlike moments, um, where the screen itself will open up and just become enormous, where you just get that, that true sense of scope. You get that at the best of what Nolan does, especially in stuff like, like a, a Tenet was almost too much of it in a weird way. Um, uh, but, but stuff like the Batman films and even Dunkirk, um, where you just get this, this giantness of the IMAX screen that truly reminds you about what, the visual impact of this kind of narrative can truly be. It's something that no book can do. It can't use montage. It can't use cinematography. It can't use Hans Zimmer's music to bring you into this world, um, whatever is on the page. And if you're going to bother to do a translation like this, you don't want to be something trivial. You want it to do something different. And that's definitely something that's showcased there. Speaking of Zimmer's music, Zimmer actually turned down working with Christopher Nolan um, on Tenet in order to do um, this film and his score is really interesting. I mean, I know he, he always sort of toys with this stuff, but there's a lot drawn from, uh, North African music, um, and, and a general sort of desert music, but also a lot of other elements. There's an entire bagpipe cue, uh, that takes place. So it's a strangely world music-y kind of thing. And in a funny way, again, because of the Messianic ties, remind me a little bit about how, bold and brave, one of my most beloved 
um, um, Scores is, which is Last Temptation of Christ by Peter Gabriel, where he took this incredible found source music, incorporated it into sort of modern textures, synthesis, um, drums from all over the world, percussion elements, different flutes, different sounds, and did that. Um, I think Zimmer is very much channeling that kind of experimentation, doing so not in a way that's appropriative. It's certainly meant to be, for lack of a better word, alien, but still have all this great organic texture, the sort of... Um, these these elements drawn from the landscape and i i think that he does a pretty phenomenal job we're very much following certain key characters where it feels like an entire world's going um along sort of uh in the background there aren't a lot of pixels fighting pixels it really feels sort of more hand on hand hand in hand much more of you know there's this grand battle going on this confrontation uh between uh giant epic families within a galactic context and yet so much of the film feels like you're in a closed room and you're in hand-to-hand -hand, uh, battle and it's that collision between scopes that i think that makes the film super interesting i look forward to seeing it again and more importantly i look forward to seeing what you guys think about this film i don't think it's going to be for everyone i think a, a bunch of people are going to see it and just be think that it's just visual and, and not a lot of narrative touch. I think a lot of people might go in and think, oh, he didn't go far enough, or why is it split in, or why are we dragging here when we could cut all this stuff out and just do it at one film? Uh, sure. Uh, all of that is, is maybe fair to be said. But for me, I am super excited that... Um, that he has laid it out, that's, that, that he's shown something that he's clearly passionate about from when he was a kid, um, that Den Denis and his collaborators have actually crafted something that absolutely works in a coherent sense, but still maintains much of the sort of density of character representation. Um, I think uh, Lynch's film failed completely on that front. He didn't really know where it was going and it didn't really have the uh, technology to tell the story. And for anybody who says that Hodorowsky's version was going to be the one it would have been an absolute hot, wet mess. Let's not kid ourselves. It would have been fascinating years later. It literally would have played out the, I love this film because it's terrible. Um, uh, there's, there's nothing about that um, vision that would have worked in any way and been commensurate with it. In many ways, maybe it would have been more interesting um, on the sort of grand cinematic scale because it would have been less tied to the, uh, the structures of the narrative to see what would happen when some visual sort of lunatic like Hodorowsky would have taken control of it. I think it's a better thing to think about the film that wasn't rather than the film that actually was. Um, for it to have been actualized, I think that would have diminished much of um, uh, the, the vision of the film in our, our minds. And when it comes to that, these films, when they're actually made, it's, 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 it's in some ways a daring thing. It's like it would be some ways easier to never make this film, um, uh, to never have to fight against expectations, to not have to uh, be challenged by both um, sort of built-in fandom and a bunch of people that are now much more schooled on much more linear um, structured. You know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are, and you know how all this stuff is going to play out. Um, for me, I think this is something that's truly engaging, something truly engrossing. I look forward to visiting it um, a few more times. For me, it's not a home run immediately on first viewing. Um, it's not, I, I wasn't left shook <laughs> like I was um, with something like Sicario, which I still maintain is one of the great films of this century, frankly. Um, uh, I didn't think it was as, my expectations for 2049 were reasonably low, because um, I'm like, this th This is going to become a really sort of by the rote um, uh, telling of this, and then I didn't think that the story had a lot of places to go. So I was super surprised and super pleased that narratively it did really interesting things. I was knew Deacons was gonna kill it. Um, and, and Dune, I think, is about as good narratively as I hoped it was going to be, which was not super high. Visually, again, um, slightly darker, slightly more murky um, than many people like, but I really love just the design of the ships. I think it lacks some of the true depth of his films like Arrival, but I think that, that as something that is meant to be essentially a paper book, uh, like a paperback novel, something to, to sort of appreciate and, and, and enjoy and delve into. 
not take so, so seriously that it becomes sort of pedantic or polemical, but also something that you take seriously enough that you actually care when th bad things happen and they have to fight over to overcome it. I think Dune is definitely a film which will find its audience. I hope it finds enough of an audience, frankly, to actually get the second one, which I believe is going to be even more interesting. God, I have to mention beforehand to Charlotte Rampling, um, she killed it this year. Uh, um, in this film, she absolutely steals the film. She shows up for like five minutes and it's just amazing. And, and God love her in, uh, Paul Verhoeven's, um, uh, film about crazy lesbian nuns, um, uh, Benedetta, uh, she is such a titanic force, um, that, you know, uh, so much of this is that you get these really, really phenomenal, uh, performers showing up and just elevating all of this. So if all you do is just sort of, um, sit back and really enjoy all these moments where these, um, tremendous actors are just giving them all within the context of this, um, I think that you're going to get a lot of it of this. For ThatShelf.com, uh, I'm Jason Gorber. Thanks so much for watching. There'll be plenty of coverage here, um, during the Toronto International Film Festival, but also all through the year. We would love to hear what you think through your comments. Please subscribe. Please follow us on social media and we will see you next video. All the best. Take care.